welcome. My name is Donna Gerson and I am the Associate Dean in charge of the Career Strategies Office here at Drexel University Thomas R. Klein School of Law. And I'm here in Philadelphia and I welcome you from near and from far uh, for this panel discussion on careers in intellectual property law. So first I want to introduce an important faculty member who directs our intellectual property law concentration. Professor Amy Landers is a nationally recognized expert in intellectual property law issues and is the author of Understanding Patent Law, now in its third edition. A teacher and a scholar, Professor Landers, welcome. Thank you so much, Dean Gerson. I'm so delighted that you put this together and I am uh, just wanna welcome everyone and I'm so excited to hear from all of you and thank you for attending tonight. Um, just as a little bit of background, I am the point of contact for Drexel students, prospective students and alumni on all issues having to do with IP law. Um, generally speaking, part of my job in addition to teaching and writing is counseling students on what their goals are and how we can support them towards meeting those goals. Um, generally, IP law has a number of different practice areas that range from sort of the transactional side, sort of working with businesses on um, sort of protecting their rights, um, applying to various agencies to obtain those rights. You'll hear tonight from some of our alums who are working with IP rights um, before various agencies. Also litigation, which is what I did when I was in practice. Um, People fight over IP rights, as you can imagine, and so there are lawyers who help them do that, uh, and that can be a really exciting area of practice as well. Um, different areas of IP law include patent law, which generally is a right that protects solutions, ideas and solutions, you know, we think of a light bulb, etc. Um, copyright law, which protects sort of creative expression, films, music, uh, writing, all kinds of um, I guess ways of expressing oneself as it's sort of put into a tangible medium of expression. Trademarks, if you think about maybe one of your favorite brands and all the things that they do to protect that brand, like Adidas, uh, Adidas has, you know, its own name, its logo, its stripes, its experience, right? There's all kinds of things, its designs, all kinds of things around uh, that brand can be protected. And there's also trade secret law, which protects uh, confidential business information. Um, at any rate, the, the program at Drexel tends to expose students to um, a core area of each of the kinds of IP law that there are so that when you go out into practice, you're more than equipped to handle pretty much any IP issue that's thrown at you. And it will be. Um, it's very unpredictable, fast changing area of the law. Um, so I will turn it over to the head of our IP society. Where is she? Where, 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 um, ah, here she is, Madeline Caretti. Hi, uh, <laughs> welcome everyone. My name is Madeline. I'm the president of the IP Law Society here at Drexel. Um, I graduated um, actually with a poli sci degree from the University of Delaware and I'm a third year law student here. And I actually came in very interested in soft IP. So as Professor Landers mentioned, so that would be like trademarks, trade secrets, copyrights. I knew I didn't have a hard science background and patents was confusing but it's okay for all the one else who are interested or prospective law students you don't need to be have a hard science background in order to be interested in ip uh, that's definitely one thing that i learned here um, you're in good hands but also uh, there's people on the board who are interested in sort of the patents hard sciences of ip um, and for like the one else if you have any questions about that stuff you can always feel free to like email us or like i mean we won't see you but you know text I have I'll give my number out there um, for people who are like in the club um, or in the IP law society um, and so the sorry <laughs> I lost my train of thought um, yeah so our we will have other meetings throughout the semester this is our first one and then you can see those um, in the fall like newsletter um, that comes around so thank you to the alumni who are here today on the call, we're all super excited to learn from you, um, even the three L's who need jobs. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna pass this back to uh, Dean Gerson. Great, thanks, Madeline. Um, 
And now we're going to introduce our panelists, all graduates of Drexel University Klein School of Law. And in the interest of time, we're going to provide links to their full bios on, and their law firms um, through the chat so you can see, because no one likes to really hear someone read someone's bio. So what I want to do to begin is to ask the panelists, um, Robin Williams, Matt Leeper, Savannah Mercius, and if my fourth panelist has shown up, as she has, um, if, she, if the fourth panelist is also here, that would be great. But if you would please introduce yourself and just say a few words about where you work now, your, your job title, um, maybe your college and major, and the general type of work you do. Um, so Robin, do you want to get us started? I will. Can everybody hear me okay? Very good. So I'm Robin Williams. Yes, that's really my name. Mm -hmm. I work in Delaware at an intellectual property boutique, a Devlin law firm, as you probably see behind me. Um, my undergrad degree is in biology, and I've got a small uh, concentration in chemistry as well. Um, I am a math and science nerd. I can't help myself. So right now what I do, I have a practice that's kind of 50-50, um, which is a little odd. I do patents and trademarks and a little bit of copyright work. I do prosecution and litigation. Um, I won't get too much into that right now, but just know that there are both sides of each practice. And there are also inter-office proceedings, which if Professor Landers would like me to, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about later. Great, thank you. Savannah? Yeah. Hi everyone, my, my name is Savannah Mercedes. Um, graduated from the Klein School of Law in 2019. Um, right now I work at Baker and Hostetler doing trademark, mostly trademark prosecution. Um, and before law school, I studied music uh, and music business at Berkeley College of Music. Great, thank you. And Matt. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Leeper, and I graduated in 2013. So I've been practicing patent law since then uh, on the prosecution side, and I've done a lot of patent drafting. I've drafted around 100 or so applications, you know, which requires you know staying on top of the case law associated therewith, and working you know closely with clients in both startups and in uh, larger entities. And I'm currently working for the law firm of Smart and Bigger, which is actually totally their name, and they are located in uh, British Columbia, Canada, where I live and work. Wonderful. And may I just say again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and share your expertise. And because of the miracle of Zoom tonight, we're able to have alumni who are from all over, including from Vancouver Island in Canada. So that, you know, you, we know that our grads are all over the country and that's wonderful. So Matt, I want to ask you about patent law because I believe you have, um, you've passed the patent bar. Sure, and, yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what the process is for becoming a, a patent, a, a registered patent agent? Sure. Well, as has been alluded to, you know, if you have the hard science background and you're eligible to take the exam uh, and you think you might be doing patent law, then the, that's kind of one of the first steps along the way, as well as kind of getting a sense of, do you want to prosecute? Do you want to help people obtain rights? You know, or do you want to be more of a litigator kind of making those decisions along the way? And so when you're in law school, if you can get the patent bar taken and passed, absolutely do that. And the rest of it is just getting a sense for how much you really enjoy technical, you know, technical work. You know, in patent drafting, it's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, nonfiction writing, a lot of reading, you know, things that others might consider a bit, you know, dense. But at the end of the day, it's my job to wade through it and then position my client with the monopoly that they can use to get some kind of competitive advantage you know, in their business. And so in that regard, even if sometimes the science is, you know, less sexy than you might like, the actual outcome is something that your clients really see strategically, they'll invest in and they'll, you know, you, be, you ultimately will help them grow and help them position themselves for the future. So I guess it's a long-winded answer, but number one, have good technical aptitude, be really comfortable with diving into complex science, you know, matters in addition to your understanding of the law. And, you know, the anything you can learn about business or helping to position those assets for your clients is also gonna be appreciated. Great, thank you. Can you can you share with us some of the courses that you took in law school that helped mm -hmm. prepare for a career in law? Any of our panelists? Yeah, sure. I, I, from, from my perspective, I always knew I was going to be on the prosecution and in the transactional side. So I took all the IP concentration classes and then took, I think, I think nine separate um, uh, transactional classes as well. And so that has allowed me to really understand my clients, you know, their business needs, how everything kind of fits together. 
how to help them, you know, uh, you know, everything from how to help them use contract law to protect their trade secrets, to how to know how to build teams and give them an equity incentive structures that are gonna let them work. And, and so all that's been, you know, really valuable in helping to balance me out as a professional, both technically, you know, legally, and then having a bit of business understanding as well. Right. Robin? I think what I think what Matt just said is really valuable. Um, even if you are an IP attorney, you should definitely, you know, look for coursework that is going to make you well rounded because you do have to understand contracts. You do have to understand the business that your client is in. And um, like Matt, a lot of us work in the emerging growth space with startups. And so you will end up advising your clients on entity formation. Sometimes when you're prosecuting a patent, you start with entity formation. And so uh, Professor Okamoto, I think he's, does he still offer his business organizations classes? So those classes are super helpful because you understand the contract. And then uh, Professor Boss teaches a phenomenal contracts class and she's amazing. Um, and, and so it, that's important. Like I wanted to take all IP classes and, and I did. I took every one that was offered, <laughs> but, but it did help definitely to round out uh, on the other side as far as the business classes go, because you really do become an advisor to your clients. Wouldn't you agree, Savannah? I would, yeah. I totally agree with everything you're saying. Um, something that stood out for me doing a lot of trademark work is, you know, you're dealing with a lot of consumer protection, right? And so there was a class, so I'm not sure if that's still available now. Um, you know, anything that would be angled sort of at like, you know, fr uh, fraud or deceptive practices, sort of how people might be using marks in commerce to mislead consumers. So there's been branches beyond just you know, prosecuting a mark to say, can we get an application for this, but how is it being used and where else does it extend to? Yep, absolutely. And, and I think those points go to that, you know, each intellectual property asset, whether it's a patent or a copyright or a trade secret, you know, or a trademark fits into part of a larger intellectual property strategy that you're trying to help develop for your client. And, you know, helping to understand that strategy takes a bit of time, you know, but then you get good at it. And then you start to be able to help not only help them pick the right things, but the right things to do when given the limited amount of dollars that they have at certain times and all, all those kind of objections become into play you know until you until all your clients become big enough to pay you know whatever pay you whatever you ask which you know that takes a while you know yeah that takes a while but that's a, a real thing um mm -hmm. especially when you work at an ip boutique um you are dealing with the clients that you do have to break down their budget either quarterly to try to make sure it's manageable because legal services are expensive um, if you're in a situation probably like Savannah is where she works for Baker, which is a larger firm, she probably doesn't have so much of that, but it, it's still, it's, I'm sure you know, because you dealt with the music business, which is the, some, which is something I feel like I don't deal with and Matt, you probably don't deal with this either, Savannah, you're probably most suited to talk about it. Um, with today's e-commerce environment and everything's online and everything's virtual, right? we are all seeing an uptick in people coming to us wanting to get protections for their e-commerce stores or for their trademarks or wanting to file proceedings to get people from stop people from cyber squatting on domain names and so savannah can probably talk about you know the copyright music licensing probably aspect of it which i know we don't talk about a lot when we start talking about ip but it's really important right now Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you bring up a really good point, especially now, I mean, here we are on Zoom, something that's been really popping up is a lot of, you know, online courses or online performances, that's been an issue, um, just sort of figuring out the licensing and, you know, making sure they're not, you know, clients aren't stepping on anyone's toes when they're trying to, you know, give a, a performance or, you know, where, where um, venues have moved their entire season to online performances, you know, what does that look like to use someone's work to broadcast someone's work, is that a public performance? Like, yeah, these are, these are questions we're looking at more and more nowadays. Thank you. And, and I, I think if every, I think that, you know, in closing that point is, is you have to look at intellectual property from the perspective is, is very broad. Um, and, and I, we are talking, I, I think I don't want to want it to be lost. And we are all talking about quite a bit. Some attorneys practice in one of these spaces usually, or the other, right? Because it, you, it can get quite convoluted, but um, IP is broad and it's all amazing and IP attorneys are absolutely the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will Thanks say, so um, I will say since, um, at least since Matt has graduated, Drexel has added a lot of classes around sort of the virtual issues and internet law, cyber law, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of 
have some overlap with other programs. That's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a quick question for Robin. So you, you practice in a very interesting uh, jurisdiction, the state of Delaware. Can you share a little bit with why Delaware is a unique jurisdiction for patent uh, practice? So absolutely. So you remember how Matt said he gets people patents and he gets you your intellectual property rights? Well, when you want to enforce those intellectual property rights, then you come to Delaware. It's either Delaware or Texas under, and I don't want to throw, start throwing cases at you guys, but there was a case decided, T.C. Hardland, which talked about venue for patent proceedings, and it pushed a lot of the cases to either Delaware, Texas, or California, right? So when you're in Delaware, that's where you have a lot of corporations that have been formed because Delaware's corporate laws are highly favorable to corporations. This is also another class taught by Professor Okamoto. <laughs> you should definitely take that class as well. Um, and so now here in Delaware, you've got the docket is full, the court docket is full of something like 473 cases in comparison to say Tennessee, where their patent docket has 24 cases. Mm -hmm. um, Delaware is one of these special places where the laws they're conservative. That, that's what we'll call them. They're very conservative. And the jurisdiction itself is conservative as far as like how you can practice. Um, I'm sure you guys have, are con contemplating talk, taking the bar exam, right? Delaware is one of those jurisdictions where you can't wave in and the license doesn't reciprocate with, with anybody else, right? So if you are practicing in Delaware, then you have that license and, and that's it. Or you can get local counsel here. Um, did that, did that, was that enough, Dean Gerson? I don't want to say too much. <laughs> and from the perspective of getting a lot of experience, when you have a busy docket in a, in a state, that means you're going to have a lot more at-bats as a, as a young professional and a yeah. mid-level professional. And so that's something worth thinking about. Um, so Drexel is known for its co-op legal education program. And this is where you get really in-depth exper experiential learning that enables you to gain some skills and really work on site while you're in law school for, um, you know, for firms, for agencies, for public interest organizations. Can you, um, for each of the panelists, will you share with us what your co-op or clinic experience was um, during law school and how that impacted your uh, career path? I'll start. Um, so my co-op was at Baker Hostetler and it affected my career path in that I was hired there. Um, it was, a, I, I, I think the co-op experience was great. Um, I really, I personally value being able to work with people one-on-one, -on -one. Um, you know, being able to learn like side by side with someone, being able to have someone sort of walk you through things. Um, and so being able to do that as a law student was one, it was a nice break for three all year. I think I just did, I think my co-op and, you know, it was a lighter schedule. So that was a nice break, but being able to go and I had the opportunity again to work where I wanted to work, which was in trademark. Uh, trademark work, trademark prosecution. Um, it was just a really good opportunity to meet people, to talk with people regularly about their career paths, you know, be able to pick their brains, you know, to a certain extent, you can read as much as you'd like, but you know, you, you know, being able to work with someone who's been doing this for 30 years, you just get a wealth of knowledge and practice tips that you otherwise wouldn't get. And I think that's what, that's what co-op really did for me. And just for clarification for those listening, about how many hours a week is a typical co-op? Oh, it's like 20, was it 20? I think it was 20. I think it's 25, but okay. I, <laughs> it's, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But I want to contextualize for students and those listening how in-depth it is. It isn't like 10 hours a week and, and it's very supervised. There's a course on the other side. It's a very rich experience. Mm -hmm. You're, you're pretty much working. You're just working. Yeah. Yeah. Matt. Oh, oh I, I, from my experience, I had, I, I had limited co-op, but I had two really great summers, uh, one for the city of Philadelphia and then one for a law firm in uh, New Jersey. And so both of those experiences, I would certainly say are critical to helping you getting an understanding of, you know, the difference between uh, a, a polished work deliverable that you're, you're submitting to another professional as opposed to an assignment, which there can be, you know, even though assignments seem rigorous, the, you know, once you're given an unlimited time to do something, then it becomes a question of, can you make something that's really, truly great if you, you're given the time you need? And so then it, then it all of a sudden, you know, changes the equation with it. 
And so definitely get experience wherever you can, paid or unpaid, whatever it is. Uh, the more you have, you know, in those experiences, you know, you'll get sharper technically, you'll read areas of the law that you wouldn't have otherwise read. And you'll probably get used to, you know, a, a bit of projection here or there where somebody helps you to correct course and figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at. And that's really what it kind of comes down to, because I mean, intellectual property is a niche of the law. And then within that, you've got other kinds of niches. And then you've got layers of, of that. You can even go further down. And so you have to decide how, you know, do you want to generalize, do you want to specialize? And the only way to figure that out is to go in there and get your hands dirty and uh, go out there and start figuring out what makes sense. Yeah, well, well said. Robin? Same thing for my co-op. Uh, my co-op experience turned me from patents to trademarks, I was under a trademark attorney who was the best woman in this world. And she did trademarks and copyrights, both sides, prosecution and litigation. And prior to that, I summered at GSK in the global patents department. Mm -hmm. And once I was introduced to really the trademark litigation, that that's really what I love. Once I was introduced to trademark litigation, I was bitten. And my co-op turned into a paid clerkship, which, turned into an offer of full-time employment but i decided to go you know with another firm but it, it was there that i was introduced to the world of trademarks and, and how in-depth it is mm -hmm. um but the co-op was fantastic and i think i'm definitely did more than 25 hours a week <laughs> definitely <laughs> so i, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about have you reflect on some skills can you share with us in retrospect, some skills that you think have been particularly important um, in your success in this practice area and in the current work that you do? Um, I'll start. Um, skills, here's a, here's a skill set that um, nobody really thinks about. So everybody's smart, especially in the intellectual property area because you generally have people who have a hard science background, so it's not uncommon to be working with another professional that's got a PhD or a PE. And so I will say one of the skill sets that, that I found to be most helpful was the skill set of dealing with other people who may or may not have um, a heightened sense of self. And, and it sometimes, and you guys, it, it will make the difference between if you, whether or not you can make it through the day and if you can appreciate the job, because what happens is, you start to appreciate the different nuances between these people. These people are hyper intelligent. They are phenomenal at what they do and usually experts in their own right. And just the personality aspect of it, when you learn to master that, everything else falls into place. I see Savannah nodding her head. <laughs> um, but this is real what I'm saying. I think that's one of the skills that nobody really talks about, but it's very, very important. If I may, yeah, I, I was. Go what came to mind for me was a, was sort of like flexibility or adaptability, and that's sort of what Robin is saying, which is whether it's like dealing with pe different types of people. Um, I think something that comes to mind in particular is like being flexible with the way. I feel like through law school, even through now, uh, I constantly have to reevaluate things that like, for example, my organization style, like you have to recognize that at different steps, you're going to need different things. Um, so it's going to require some flexibility. So while, you know, maybe up until this point, you know, X, Y, and Z has worked for you this entire time, you know, it's going to require once, you know, once you gained a certain skill set, you know, then you're, then you're managing your docket flow, or then you're managing something else, you're managing your coworkers, you know, it, it, it requires requires a lot of adaptability. So I, I don't know if that's a skill per se, but something to consider. Thank you. Definitely. And, and, and I, I would add in compliment to those, you know, you, you still got to get the blocking and tackling in terms of you got to have that gear, whatever subject matter you're diving into that you're comfortable going as deep as possible to really truly understand, you know, the answer. And so sometimes in patents that can be wading through, you know, literally thousands of patents to kind of say, okay, this is, this is the answer. And you have to be able to kind of retain and, and navigate through. And then you've got to be able to communicate that back out. So to be able to dive into that depth and out, because, you know, it's, sometimes I, I come across situations where the client is paying you in part because they just can't, they're not going to be able to get this deep, even if they try. And so, and so at that point, they're like, okay, yeah, I'll give you your 350 an hour or whatever it is, because there's no way that I can, uh, they can, they recognize your ability to go deep and then make it simple for them. And that's what can allow them to make a strategic decision, you know, and it's also, also kind of, you know, 
that ability to kind of keep in mind that, you know, nobody really wants a, you know, a nail or a hammer. What they want to do is they want to hang a picture on the wall. Right. And so a patent is effectively just the way to help them accomplish what they want. And so you've got to just hit the mark and, and make sure you're, you're giving them what they want. So you're not, you know, giving them a $20,000 product when they want a $10,000 product or vice versa, telling them when they need to step up and, you know, all those kinds of things start to come into play and they're all based on doing that analysis and being able to, you know, interpret the law and, and, and give it back to them in a meaningful way. Yeah, and kind of piggybacking on what Matt said, one of the ladies in the trademark prosecution uh, group at Baker told me when, when we were there having a meeting for a due diligence group, that listening to your client is the, the best asset that you can have as an attorney, mm -hmm. because you get to, you listen to just reiterating what Matt just said, what the client wants, what their budget is what their goal is, everyone's goals are different. Um, and so I think the skill of being able to sit back and listen and ingest everything that's being said to you um, and being able to regurgitate that back, like I understand this is what you wanna understand, this is what you're saying. Um, I think that is a phenomenal skill that really helps you in practice. Yeah, and then the other one I would add to it, you know, in the beginning, just worry about doing really good quality. You know, efficiency isn't as important as it is just getting a, a deliverable that somebody really loves and wants to pay for or accomplishes the objective or whatever it is. But as you get a couple of years in, you know, there's, you know, practicing the law is one thing. Making money on practicing the law is another desirable thing. And so the more organized you are, the more you're thinking about, you know, giving your client what they want and nothing more, kind of figuring out that line. Um, that's not a skill you needed to develop in law school per se, but, it, you know, if you want a partnership to someday look at you as an asset, somebody they can make money on, the more you understand how they make money and how you play a role in that, um, it, you know, it doesn't hurt to keep an eye on the ball in that regard as well. Thank you. Now, it just so happens that all three of our panelists this evening work at law firms, but I wanted to um, ask you to discuss a little bit um, where you find other kinds of patent lawyers, for example, in in-house legal departments and corporations, which may not be familiar to our, our listeners in government. Can you speak a little bit about the many places that IP lawyers may turn up? Yeah, I, I can handle the patent one and then, and then gladly defer. On the, on the patent side, you'll see that in-house for sure. I have one client that is a nonprofit and they, are, they wanna utilize patent rights to maintain control of their uh, prosthetic limbs in certain parts of the country. So that's, their, you know, that's an interesting place. They, they work for me as a client, but they could just as easily be, I could easily, the, the role is so close that it's almost like an in-house role. Um, the, in the, in, in, inside the government, they're all over. There's uh, the other one I would share, there's a really cool one, a really cool job out there, which I encourage somebody to get. I think it's inside of the FBI and you, pr you prosecute patents on behalf of the federal government and like you sue people for patent litigation. So that, that job is out there. And then of course the patent offices, not just in the United States, but of course around the world, you know, both in Canada and in Europe or other areas where you can, you know, your expertise can be valuable and um, you know, that out there. And then, you know, there are plenty of just solo inventors who are patent attorneys who are also inventors and just figure out how to do it themselves and go that way. Um, you know, the guy, uh, some on the call may be too old to remember, but there was a toy out there called the Micro Machine which was uh, invented by a husband and wife patent attorney team. And then they went on to do all kinds of, 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 of uh, projects there, you know, from the, from the role of both a patent attorney as an inventor. So it's, there are many cards in the deck to play. Savannah, you wanna talk about the trademark side? Sure, yeah. Um, so like Matt said, you can obviously work in house. Um, and so what, as Dean Gerson was mentioning, that's working sort of, um, for a legal department for a company, um, for trademarks that looks like brand management a lot of the time. So you'll have large corporations, I think Under Armour has its own trademark department, um, you know, depending on what sort of portfolio they have, for them it makes sense to have people in-house and doing that management there. Um, you can also be um, an, ex uh, an examining attorney at the USPTO, the U United States Patent and Trademark Office. So I'm on the other side of that, but these are the people to whom I submit my, my trademark applications, you know, they'll look at it and determine whether it, it's up to snuff or they'll reject it or what have you. So that's something else you can do. Um, 
but, and of course you can, you know, you can do solo practice, um, but largely it comes down to working in house and doing a lot of brand management, but sort of what to Robin and Matt were saying before, which was like to be a little broader in, in the courses that you end up taking in the, the sort of the scope of your work, particularly when you're working in house, it often will encompass other things. So sometimes you can just be say a trademark in house attorney, but oftentimes you're doing a lot of business management and you might be doing copyright portfolio management or patent portfolio management. So depending on what you're working on, uh, those other skill sets will come into play. And I think the only thing we didn't touch on like in houses is, is uh, you know, clearing houses like for music music rights, things of that nature. Again, this is Savannah's area, not my area. <laughs> um, the things of this nature, like you have a lot of people who, who specialize in, in clearing and licensing music for like films and um, advertising projects, et cetera. I, that's, I guess that's kind of an in-house function. I, yeah, I suppose like, I, or do, do, uh, Savannah, do you know, do they have attorneys at ASCAP who yes. work on that side of it? Mm -hmm. ASCAP, PMI, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell us what ASCAP is? So oh, yes, <laughs> ASCAP is the American. Oh my God, American Society right. of Composers and Performers. Don't I? I should probably know what it stands for. But it's a performance rights organization. Uh, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are the three major organizations, and they um, it's essentially administer public performance licenses on behalf of artists. So, oh, really? so getting a public performance license for say, you know, being able to play, play songs in the mall or playing or the song, the music that you hear in a bar, for example. Yeah. And, and they, they, I have a composer client. So my understanding as well, they also determine how much you get paid. You know, you put, you put your piece of music out there. They're the ones that kind of figure out it's been listened to about this many times. You know, somebody owes you this many quarters or whatever the, whatever the calculation is. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, t in today's news, it was just, maybe it was coincidental, but um, there was a lot of news about fashion law. And it, it's, it, it sort of relates, it's like first cousin of kind of trademark type, uh, and maybe copyright law. But that's another side issue that has to do a lot with intellectual property law issues. Um, it's small, but it's out there, it's a niche practice, and people are working at all kinds of designer fashion houses and companies handling trademarks and copyrights there. Another entry-level job out of law school that one of our recent graduates uh, successfully attained was a clerkship um, the year after graduating with the USPTO, um, working for the, the judges there. And that's another possibility for directly after graduation uh, just to think about. Um, which kind of leads me to the idea of brainstorming about uh, how you research job opportunities in IP law and in, in careers. Um, you know, the Career Strategies Office at Drexel has a wonderful IP career guide that we always supply to our students. It's behind a firewall on our Simplicity website, and we update it um, as well with a lot of information. But you know, in, in your experience as practitioners, um, what resources do you go to or think about when exploring or looking at different career paths or, or jobs in IP law? So I'll, so in addition to, you know, your online resources like indeed.com and, you know, obviously looking for whatever CSO puts up, something that I think was really helpful was I spent a lot of time over the summers just meeting attorneys. I felt like it was dating. I felt like I was like having coffee with someone, trying to get my questions together, but I was just meeting people, um, which, which, you know, if that's not, if that's not your vibe, that's, that's fine too. Um, but, you know, just getting, you know, 20, 30 minutes with someone to be able to have a conversation with them and sort of get an idea of how they ended up where they ended up. Um, so that was something that was really helpful because sometimes you meet people and they put you in touch with someone else who puts you in touch with someone else and then you end up <laughs> with a job. So um, that was something that was, that was really, I think, helpful for me just to understand also like what my potential career trajectory could be. That's great. Networking, very important. I second that. That's, that's it for me. It's, it's networking. I mean, it's, it's who you know. Uh, Drexel has a pretty active CSO, I will say. Um, in comparison to like other people that I know who went to other law schools, their CSO might not have been as active 
as Drexel CSO. I can definitely tell you that just based on what friends were telling me when we were in school at the same time, like Drexel CSO gives you a lot of help, a lot of assistance. Um, and, and also like Dean Gerson will reach out, she'll reach out to you. If she's got something that she thinks you're a good fit, she will reach out to you without a doubt. So, I mean, it's always great to have that type of support, but just echoing what Savannah said, for the most part, it's networking. I mean, you can try to find a job on the internet, but in reality, it, you, in the practice of law, you're probably going to find a job through networking and through mm -hmm. somebody that you know. Yeah. And by the way, that reminds me too, the Loyola Patent Job Fair is a specialty job fair that is held in Chicago that any law student who is um, rising into second year can do for second summer. This is probably all jargony to you right now, but I want to let you know that um, our office pays for the registration fees for that. Um, it is happening this year. Um, and because of COVID-19, it's happening in January. It's happening remotely, but it is happening. And our students get jobs through this job fair program. And it's been very, very uh, useful. Um, and I also wanted to put a plug in for Professor Landers and the Benjamin Franklin Inns of Court, which our students can mm -hmm. join and become active in. Um, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, Professor Landers, <laughs> you can explain like in, you know, 30, 30 to 60 yeah. seconds what an inn of court is. It's, a, it's basically a way to network with a local Philadelphia bar who are IP lawyers. Um, and it's essentially you, you, judges, practitioners, and um, a lot of other Drexel students. Also, we have a few students from other local law schools. Um, basically, it's a way to socialize and then put on a, um, uh, a topic. In other words, you work in groups and you research a particular area. Um, the end of the year, there is usually an oral argument. It's usually argued by students, law students. Um, it's a really great experience. Um, it gives you practice networking. It, you, you get to know the people in the Philly area very, really well. Um, next meeting, September 17th. So put that on your calendars. Thank yeah. you. And by the way, as an invitation to all of my first year law students who are, are listening to this podcast, whether live or recorded, it would be really important for you to let us know if you're interested in receiving information about um, patent law positions because the, the, the track for that happens a little faster than it does for other 1L students. So by identifying yourself, and you can just email me offline and I would be happy to compile a list, share it with Professor Landers and with um, Madeline Carenti, the president of the uh, IP Law Society, so we can all work together to help you achieve your goals. Um, oh, and there's one more thing too, the American Intellectual Property Lawyers Association, which is a, a specialty bar association of IP lawyers. We will also um, assist you in joining that uh, if appropriate. So. Is there anything else I'm missing, Matt? I... No, the only thing I would share in terms of, first of all, I got both my, my jobs from the Career Center. So they're definitely a, a, an asset, you know, work it. Uh, just make sure you put your best foot forward. I mean, get your resume to where you're selling whatever strengths you have from your previous life, whatever, if they're academic or professional. And, you know, do your best to get your grades because just because you're just because you're interested in positioning yourself as intellectual property, they're still going to expect you to have a competitive, uh, you know, grade ranking, at least law firms are. In, you know, in the, in the other areas of law that you may not be as interested at, you know, you know, for example, constitutional law is a wonderful area of law, but it doesn't intrinsically interest me as much. So I really had to read two or three study guides and dig in to really get committed to that subject. And then fortunately, once it's done, I can focus on the other IP stuff I want, but you've got to be competitive with it. And if you really have the hard science background, take your patent bar. It's about 100, 150 hours of study time, plan for it, take it, have it. As the sooner you have that, the more competitive you'll be in, in the job hunt, because just having the hard science background will eliminate some percentage of your competition. Actually having that license eliminates another percentage, and then pretty soon you're at the top of the pack. Yeah. So. Yeah, and all the information about the patent bar and the requirements and uh, et cetera is on the uh, USPTO website, which mm -hmm. I think email will post, but it's uspto.gov. Um, 
I'm being mindful of the time, so I'm going to wrap up with one more question for you, but I'm going to ask the participants who are, are, who are listening to queue up some questions in the chat that maybe we, that we can pose. So the last question that I'm going to toss out is a, uh, is a reflection question, because I think it's really important that we um, look back to look forward. So um, since you have one Ellen Perspective Law students listening, uh, they're at the very beginning. And if you could go back in time, what would you tell your younger self, um, either when considering law school or as, a, as put yourself in the shoes of being a 1L all over again? What <laughs> advice would you have? Uh, well, what, I'll throw out one simple one. Uh, you know, don't, don't worry about skimping out on a fancy dinner for a couple of years. You know, you can rack up those bills if you want, but you can also you know, bide your time and focus on your study. So just from a cash, man from a cash management perspective, don't lose sight of the end picture. Because I've had some friends who you know, started the journey and went way too deep in a direction. And I've had others who rebounded just fine, but just be mindful, manage it, and then don't worry about it. Just go make the money and pay it off and life goes on. I think- By the way guys, he's talking about student loans. <laughs> yeah, but just in general, you know, it's, uh, it's, well, it's an area of concern, you know, you're going on this big journeys. I, I left a previous career, so I left wage, you know, to go that way. So that was, you know, for a long, I had, a, I had some occasional internal struggles of, gosh, you know, should I, have, should I have just kept going on that path? Is this the right thing to do? Whatever it is. At the end of the day, I, I, I more than doubled my salary and I like the work better. So I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy with it. And are, is there some data and some other things associated with it? Yes, but that will work itself out in time. Just be responsible, have a plan manage it and just realize it doesn't just disappear like keep in mind what's going on and, and you know work it like you would work any other anything else serious thank you i would offer um looking back on 1l year um i would say that it's okay if you feel that you don't under understand the material after the first or second read through mm -hmm. um it's a lot, it's, it's a lot from volume, it's a lot just to wrap your brain around. Um, and so I think one all year, I spent a lot of time feeling like, oh man, I, 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 I know I read this, <laughs> but I didn't understand it. Um, but that's okay, this, it's not, you know, law school is not easy and I don't know if anyone said that, but it's not. Um, and you know, it, sometimes it will take the, you know, multiple pass throughs or for me, it was a lot of highlighting. Um, but it doesn't mean just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, mm -hmm. but it was just something to keep in mind. I think I spent a lot of time worrying needlessly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think my younger self would probably know one L year appreciate the study guide, especially like with Matt said, I think, for some of you on the call who may have a hard science background, subjects like con law will not come naturally to you. And you will, that's the last thing you'll want to do, like appreciate the study guide, appreciate the treatise and, and learn to use them. That I would, mm. I definitely echo that, yeah. Yeah, I read two treaties simultaneously for con law, plus the textbook. So right. it was a heavy reading, but yeah, you know, I, I was able to raise my hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the standard, you all. <laughs> for, you, yeah. for you hard science people, that's the standard. Be able to raise your hand. <laughs> Ask questions. I mean, enough mastery of it that I could like, you know, engage. It was the only way I could get myself to do it. As yeah. if, if, if I'm either going all the way in or, or I'm just going to be clueless and, and I'm too competitive to be clueless. Well, thank you. Your enthusiasm is palpable. So I want to say thank you again. Our next Career Explorations program will be on Monday, September 14th, 515. The focus is going to be on civil litigation and dispute resolution. And we're looking forward to having a wonderful panel. But this was a truly great way to kick off the year. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you uh, in the future. And if you have any questions, please email me directly. So have a good night. Thank you so much, Dean Kirsten. Mm -hmm. It was great to see you guys. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> so good to Pleasure. See you. Stay in touch.